Hey, Mike. What, son? Mike Watson. He's on the show tonight. You're watching Best of Three. Welcome to Best of Three, your weekly FGC talk show presented by The Daily Dot. I'm Efren Salinas, your host, and with me as always is our co-host. Mike Donka Schiller? That's the one. Michael Donka Schiller, sometimes referred to as Miguel. Gracias, Whew. Schiller. I'm glad you remember that. Guys, today we're going to do what we always do, break down some news in the first round, go into an interview in the second round. I wonder who it'll be. You know it is. Mr. Watson. And then the third round, we're going to go look at some matches from CEO Taku. You're going to be breaking down some of that Guilty Gear action. Definitely going to try. But first, our boy Ian is going to break down what went down over the weekend. Tokyo crowns another Capcom Cup qualifier while New Orleans lives up to the hype. I'm Ian Barker, and this is The Leaderboard. Another week, another win for Red Bull's Bonchan as another Capcom Cup qualifier concludes. Bonchan carried considerable momentum from his big win at the SoCal Regionals into the weekend, taking the Ultra Hyakushu Cup in Tokyo. Bonchan had already qualified with the win in SoCal, giving the automatic qualifier berth to second place finisher Nemo. While Nemo didn't take the title himself, he certainly earned the qualifier spot, eliminating Fudo and Momochi from the tournament. On the other side of the fighting game spectrum, a pair of Smash tournaments went the distance at the MLG World Finals. In Super Smash Bros. Melee, Juan Hungrybox Debeedma stamped his authority early, sweeping rising contender Drug Fox three games to zero before beating Jeffrey Axe Williamson to secure a spot in the Grand Final. Jason Mewtwo King Zimmerman would meet him in the Grand Final, running through the loser's bracket after a stunning loss to Axe. Despite Mewtwo King's recent run of form, it was Hungrybox that took the championship three games to one in the Grand Final for his third title of the year. Mewtwo King didn't take the loss lying down, however, putting the Puff player on blast after the loss. Twitter beef? I'm pretty sure that makes us a real fighting game, Smash fans. Over in Smash Bros. for Wii U, all eyes were on Gonzalo Zero Barrios to extend his prolific tournament win streak, though recent struggles had the champ in the crosshairs of his many capable opponents. The top six saw a familiar combination of Zero, Isan, Nairo, Ally, and Mr. R, but Nairo scored a stunning winner's finals victory over Zero to set the tone for the grand final. After battling back against Esam, Zero looked to hold on to his crown against his long-standing rival, but Nairo would become Kingslayer in the lights of New Orleans, ending Zero's streak at 53 consecutive tournament wins and earning the title of MLG Champion. That'll do it for us here at the Leaderboard. Be sure to check out our live AMA with Hungrybox on Thursday. Well, there you have it. Bonchan takes Capcom Cup, and I think there was some smash that got played at MLG. Joining us to talk about CEO Taku, we have a special guest. This is not Watson yet. We have none other than John Velociraptor, Raptor Guerrero from Event Hubs. John, thank you for joining us, man. Hey, what's up, team? How you guys doing? We're doing great, man. Uh, we're going to try to do this a little bit more often, bring on our friends from Event Hubs to come talk about tournaments. In this case, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we're going to talk about CEO Taku. Uh, if for anybody who didn't catch that, John, could you give us a quick breakdown on what made that tournament different from your average FGC tournament? Well, uh, most of the time, at least nowadays, uh, the big tournaments are going to be carried by uh, the big mainstream games like Street Fighter IV, uh, Mortal Kombat X right now, you know, Marvel, you know, back in the day a little bit. But CEO Taku was one of these big venues ran by Jabaley, who does CEO, one of the biggest tournaments of the year. You know, one of those in that bracket right under Evo. And uh, it was all anime games, which, as far as the FGC is concerned, is kind of a new thing, something you don't really see mainstream nowadays. So uh, it was an interesting thing, and it, and it seemed like it was a huge success. So pretty exciting all around. You know, to me, what's interesting, and I'm sure you were very excited that there was an anime-only tournament, as you are, have a PhD in anime games, if I'm not mistaken. Something like that. Uh, what I thought was cool, or interesting, right, the, one I, the way I like to think about it is, we had Vai on last week, and he was talking about how eventually Street Fighter is going to have its own tournaments, and people are going to be mad. 
okay, well, what's going to happen to all the rest of those games that people still want to compete in? And it seems to me like uh, Jabali is positioning himself to say, hey, we've got plenty of love left. That's not to say that this is the only anime tournament that exists, but he puts on big tournaments. He has a lot of weight. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, his is the only tournament that rivals Evo as far as entrance and, and all that business. So your thoughts on uh, CEO Jabali doing a CEO Taku tournament? I think it's a good thing. I think we need to still have the tournaments which represent, you know, the whole plethora of games. I mean, I certainly play the the multitude. I've played Marvel, I play the anime games, I play Street Fighter, etc. But I think it's nice for, you know, the games to have their own spot in the sun. A lot of people tune in because they've flown out the Japanese players specifically over these games. We had Goichi, we had Dogger, we had Kazunoko. And it, it allows people to see something that they normally wouldn't because it's on at eight o'clock on Sunday or done on Friday at a normal tournament. But it really got to, to shine more than it normally does at CEO Taku. Uh, John, before I uh, cut to you here for your thoughts, I wanted to share this tweet. Uh, do you think you could read that for us, uh, Danka? Or at least I tell me who this is that's, that's, that's on there. Uh, the Hotto who runs uh, Combo Breaker mm -hmm. and has done various other things in the FGC, including help with CEO Taku, said that they found the PS3 they thought were missing and thought it had been stolen. But the, the idea that it's good news and that it even has to be said, CEO Taku is a proudly a zero theft event. John, how do you feel about that? <sighs> That's a, it's kind of a bad <laughs> look that you have to say that to begin with, right? But I mean, I'm, I'm happy that we're taking a, a step towards that, that it's, you know, that we're excited that, hey, there was no theft at this event. <laughs> but uh, man, as... as Part of the FGC, I really hope that we can move toward that just being a, a normal, a normal happening where it's like we don't have to worry about people stealing this and that. Like, like, come on, FGC, please, please, like, like <laughs> carry yourself with some class, man. Yeah, and I mean that's something that we've talked about again. When nobody likes to bring it up, but it's uh, something that you can't uh, disregard, right? It happens in the FGC. People get their sticks stolen all the time, and so on and so forth. Um, we're going to talk about more about CEO Taku later when we uh, yeah. go over the replays. So I want to move on to our next topic that we want to talk to John about, and that is the beef, or as uh, Ultra David was saying on Twitter, the tweef, Twitter beef, oh between KBR and FChamp. Who wants to set it up for us, Donka or John, what uh, the beef is about? I guess I, I can try. Um, let's hear it. So Cane Blue River, obviously, as you know, won Evo and FChamp, who won in 2012, came on our show and mentioned that he thinks he can still beat Kane Blue River. Mm -hmm. And over time, including at SoCal Regionals, this has evolved to the point where Kane did not enter SoCal Regionals. And he had a variety of reasons for that, which I know you know a little bit more about. Mm -hmm. um, and because of this, Ryan has said that he's not a real champion, he's not defending himself, and that he needs to play F-Champ in some sort of exhibition to prove that he is skilled at the game whatsoever. Now, before we get into our opinions about it, I know, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, here on our dais today, we have differing opinions on whose side is on who, but I re did reach out to KBR and I asked him, hey, uh, FCHAP is really putting you on blast. How do you respond? He basically said, I respond by not responding, um, and I said, fine, forget the drama. He says he doesn't want to add to the drama. Forget the drama. Forget FCHAP. The question remains, if you are the EVO champ, are you obligated to continue to compete? He responded. Why would I be obligated to compete? Right now, nobody else has a call on when I can play or not. If it's about SoCal Regional in particular, I could, I could not have competed anyway because I got to the venue past 6 p.m. and pool started at 4, as opposed to FChamp's statesman, statement that me arriving on Thursday and the tournament being on Saturday. But I had already decided to not enter a few days before the event. Your thoughts? Hey, he, couldn't, he, he wouldn't have been able to do it anyway. Uh... Can I can I take the lead here, John? Let's hear it. Uh, so, I, okay. So l let me back up a little bit. This is how I see things going down. First of all, uh, F Champ is accusing first and foremost Cane Blue River of being of not being a champion because he won't play him. Uh huh. Okay. Well, this is how I see the situation. Filipino champ, probably one of the top three Marvel competitors in the world, and I don't think you'll find very many people that will contest you on that. Right. So that's already established. He doesn't win Evo this year. Kane Blue River does. Kane Blue River had a good day on the right day, right? I mean, uh, he's not as good as F Champ, and I don't think very many people are contesting that. 
Um, but F Champ in his video created this uh, almost like this persona of Kane Blue River that would say, I'm better than F Champ. I beat him. I'm, I'm not, I beat him, but I did better than him at Evo. So, uh, so of course, I'm better than him. And uh, as though Kane Blue River were flaunting it all over the place, making a big deal about it. And that's not the case at all. That's not what Kane Blue River has done. And in fact, in the video that F Champ uh, posted, he said, I went up to Cain Blue River and said, hey, I'll play you at SCR. And Cain Blue River says, no, you will probably beat me. I don't want to play you. And, and that should be where it stops. That should be where it ends. Uh, no, Cain is not obligated to play anybody else. Uh, technically, you have to wait until the next Evo to see who wins Evo. Like, that's, that's, that's I think, where, where things okay, stand. Right but, now. I mean, we have somebody here who played Ultra Street Fighter 4 for a month, beat Integra <laughs> with his poison, and yeah, then retired. Yeah. He says, I'm never playing again. Is that fair to somebody like Integra? And this, obviously, I'm using this as an example, but is it fair to all these Marvel players who are hungry? And I think, if I'm mistaken in that video, Champ says, I kept it a secret that I was going to be at SCR because I knew that uh, KBR was going to duck me. I asked KBR, if you had entered SCR, how do you think it would have gone down? This was his response. Terrible, because I arrived hurried jet lagged with lack of sleep and with other personal issues on my mind that plus the steep emergency registration fee are the reasons of why i decided not to play i just wanted to take advantage that there would be an event on my last weekend in usa this year to hang out and say farewell to people i've become close while going around i mean i i hate to kill the drama here i think champ himself is doing this on purpose obviously he wants to get the match in i think and i know both of the guys and i think the problem here is that Kane isn't joking around and Champ kind of is, you know, and mm -hmm. Kane has taken this very personally at this point. He doesn't like it. And there's got to be a point where you realize this guy doesn't want to play you. On the other hand, I think he could handle a lot better. And I think, and Ryan said himself, it doesn't have to be for money. He can play. And if he loses, he's not going to look much worse to the community than he does right now. And he's mm -hmm. certainly not obligated to, but I think he could have turned it into a fun exhibition. I think he could have talked a little shit back. I think he could have played the match, win or lose, and had fun with it. And it would have been good for the scene as a whole. And now it's just become this big, you know, shit show, for lack of a better word. And I, I think they're both champs at fault, but, but Kane could have saved it. You know, I think where it really went off the rails was when uh, KBR tried to reach out to uh, That was Champ, ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. Uh, 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 yeah, his team and uh, potentially a threatened defamation of character. I mean, come on. But uh, I do want to point out something. I think it was two years ago or maybe more, I spoke to F Champ, and it was right on the cusp of, crap, was it Capcom Cup or the Street Fighter 25th anniversary? But it was where uh, Marvel was going to be played at an official Capcom event and Nemo had said, or Nemo had said, if they wanted to give away free money, they should put F Champ as the final boss. <laughs> and I brought that up to F Champ. I was like, you know what? We get it. That happens all the time. Uh, like, it's just shit talking, and that's just the way it's done. Meaning, to, which to me means that F Champ, that's his style. That's the, his role, totally. right? Um, as you pointed out, KBR maybe was not uh, mentally there to play that game with him. And when he brought it to the, when he, as he said, when he brought it to the sponsor, he just kind of brought it to a level that I think Champ wasn't expecting, and that's when it turned into actual, you know, <laughs> an actual feud, a feud as opposed to just you know an, an attempt to get him to play. Well, who, uh, why is why does KBR have to put up uh, his? I don't know. I guess his uh, his status as a player by by putting uh, or by fighting F Champ in an exhibition like where does it say in the contract of winning Evo you know the hypothetical contract that that champions are forced to do that like he yeah, should but, be but, able but to John, enjoy his on. moment in the spotlight John but seriously though like if you win Evo and then you know you, you can argue that he wasn't ducking that he had his reasons but if you don't allow people to compete against you isn't that kind of a shady thing not a shady thing but a uh, unfair thing people want you to fight you man I would be upset if I were F Champ and I said hey KBR I bet I can beat you. And he goes, no, you can't. I'm way better than you, but I'm not going to play you. Then I would have an issue. But, but KBR, if this is only about status and this is only about pride, KBR said to F Champ, allegedly, uh, I don't think I can beat you. So he's already bowed out. He's already acknowledged, yes, you are one of the three best in the world. Uh, I, I can't beat you. I won Evo because I, you know, I, I did well on the right day, but I'm not contesting that I'm better than you. I'm not saying I'm better than you. I'm not contesting how good you are, and that's where we're going to leave it. And I don't feel like playing you. I don't feel like maybe getting embarrassed or losing in front of everybody. I want to be the Evo champion and not the Evo champion that lost to F-Champ. 
Well, um, go ahead. I mean, you're totally right. And the fact of the matter is that he's not obligated to do anything. And a lot of this comes from, you know, this whole is Marvel dead situation that's going on. And is it dead? No, but it seems like it just got a shot in the arm. Is it at the point where Evo is a tournament that people care about and majors are getting a lot less viewership? Yeah. Champ said himself he barely practiced and, you know, won pretty easily and didn't even get to play the guy that he's supposed to, the Evo champ. He could help out the game, I guess, by playing, but that's that's not what he's there to do. You know, he's he won Evo mm-hmm. and he can do whatever the hell he wants. So I, not I 100% much to agree with you, though, that if he wants to keep his game alive, and you have to admit it may not be dead, but it's definitely fledgling, you know? And mm-hmm. uh, to do something like make a hype exhibition, the Evo champ and F champ, that would be great for the scene. So if I'm Kane Blue River and I want to keep my game alive, I think it is, from that point of view, his responsibility to hype things up that way. So I, I agree with you there. Well, let me tell you the last thing that Nick said um, to me on the topic. In a lot of ways, this has been a help. This has been helpful because now I know for sure a lot of people's true faces, but that when they see me in majors, greet me normally and are not capable of telling me what they think to my face. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a ton of that in the FGC, isn't there? Well, John, I'm putting you on the spot. How much of that exists? Be, <laughs> I dare you to be someone that's on a, like a show like this or, or you know, on stream regularly at a, at a venue like Wednesday Night Fights or an event hubs writer like I am, and where everyone knows you, yes, people will come up to you, they will talk to you one way, and then <laughs> the stream arc or the, uh, the chats or the comment sections are a whole other story. That just, that's human nature. It's going to come with the territory. Um, and, and I would say to KBR, if you're going to be an Evo champion, if you're going to be a face at all, you're going to have to endure that kind of a thing. Sorry, them's the breaks. John, uh, we're going to move on from KBR and FChamp. And I would hope that you could do me a favor here. I was doing research for our Watson interview, which is coming up soon, uh, mm-hmm. in a couple of minutes, in fact. And I wanted to know, I was researching specifically the split between Alex Valle and Mike Watson and doing Wednesday Night Fights, Super Arcade, and all that business. And in Googling that, guess what article came up? An interview that you did with Watson immediately after that split. It had to do with the uh, Daigo incident. I'm Mm -hmm. wondering if, uh, by way of setting us up for this interview, you could recap that for us so that it's fresh on everybody's mind. Okay. Well, before I jump into that, I just want to say that I see both Alex Valle and Mike Watson as uh, forefathers of the current FGC Uh here in America. Uh, obviously Mike Watson's the Benjamin Franklin. You could totally see him in a Benjamin Franklin <laughs> getup, right? Uh, no, I mean, you, if you've seen something like uh, Bang the Machine and, and, and you know where we come from, you know these guys are very good friends uh, and they both come from similar places and they both are huge in the fighting game community. So uh, knowing that, we go forward into the, uh, the whole Wednesday Night Fights and Super Arcade are together and Watson is going to throw his Evo Moment 37 reloaded uh, event, his, his major, where he's going to have a bunch of the old games, have a bunch of the old guys come back through, and we're going to relive the glory days, and the kind of the capstone of that was Daigo was going to be there to play against Justin Wong and Third Strike, and they were going to you know recreate that, that feeling in the same exact building, at the same exact venue, everything, right? So that was Watson's big thing, and uh, I don't know the, the, the intricate details of it, but what turned out happening was that uh, someone along the line said uh, Daigo is no longer coming out after they had promised that he was. And I don't know the reasoning why, but obviously that pissed Watson off. And so he got on his stream on Super Arcade. I think it was a Friday night. It was there at the arcade. And he just started going off on a, a couple of different people, some big names. And it was, you know, it wasn't the most professional of approaches because, hey, Mike Watson, you know, <laughs> we play in arcade laundromats and stuff like that and punch people for doing throws in ST. Like, that's Watson's kind of style. So Valle sees this and being associated with that, having level up as part of Wednesday Night Fights and Super Arcade and everything, he says, well, I can't have my partner being super unprofessional. So he shoots down to the arcade. They have some private conversation. And right then and there, the, the level up and Super Arcade uh, union dissolves. And they had to go their own separate ways. And, and I, they, they're still friends, to my knowledge. And it's still, um, it's, they're obviously in competition now with Wednesday Night Fights coming back and Super Arcade coming back. But um, that's just business. So uh, as far as that whole thing went, the, uh, the Daigo incident was that Daigo couldn't come, Watson got really pissed off, and didn't handle himself in the same way that Faye wanted to handle himself. So he had to separate himself from Watson, and that's as far as I really know about it. And before we make this seem like a bigger beef than it is, I mean, these guys are still friends. Um, yes. Alex Faye was on the show last week, and he stated as such. 
Um, last week, Watson was supposed to have his uh, uh, Super Arcade Grand Reopening or relaunching or whatever, and uh, it wasn't there, and that's precisely why he's on the show to talk about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he did put out a tweet, hey, Super Arcade's not ready yet. Go support Alex Valle and his stream, the Wednesday Night Fight stream at the Esports Arena. So, I mean, that should uh, you know paint the picture for how these guys are with each other. Okay, John, thank you so much for joining us. Guys, thank you for having me. This has been great, and I, uh, I, I like you guys. Um, I appreciate you having me on. It's been good times. Excellent. John, Velociraptor, Guerrero from Event Hubs, our brother from another mother. An actual accredited <laughs> fighting game player as well. Exactly, yeah. I mean, we don't have <laughs> enough uh, fighting game cred, at least in Street Fighter, <clears throat> uh, on this uh, show, so that's how we needed to get Velociraptor on. John, Thanks, uh, I'm sure we'll do this again in the, in the future, but thank you very much for joining us and for the recap and getting us all up to date. Thank you, guys. See you guys later. See you later, Internet. All right, later, man. Okay, that was pretty cool. I mean, I appreciated him breaking that Definitely. down. He did the original interview. You know, who better to ask than the guy that was there and asked the questions? Okay, I'm very excited about the next thing that we're going to show. Do you know Brandon, the Odin son, Alexander, I, I bearded know him well. straight from Valhalla, Brandon runs Ultra Arcade in San Antonio. Runs Ultra Arcade in San Antonio, sponsoring players like Tom Brady and uh, Noel Brown and a ton of other notable players in Killer Instinct and Mortal Kombat and so on. They're going to host the Killer Instinct World Cup. And guess who has that debut trailer exclusive for the best of three audience? We're going to roll it. Here it goes. Hello guys, we are back. I hope you enjoyed that trailer. Uh, Ultra Arcade will have that up on their channel soon. Those statues are pretty cool, man. Those statues are, are pretty rad, indeed. Uh, I'm not sure where I would find a place to put them, but very cool. You'll be able to get those at the World Cup, uh, Kinnerstein World Cup. Second, Helio Saga is the band that's going to be playing. If you buy their album, this is me doing air guitar, or maybe some kind of high, whatever guitar. Anyway, uh, you can help uh, add to the pop bonus as well. So, a lot of cool stuff going on. Go to the Killer Instinct World Cup uh, website. It's through Ultra Arcade, and there's plenty more information there. And the next tournament where you can uh, qualify for that is in Japan, coming up very soon. All right, we're going to go into round two, where we interview a notable personality in the SEC. A bigger mic than I. A bigger mic. <laughs> and on this segment of Mike and Mike... Uh, Watson, before we bring you on, I'm going to play a little bit of video just to catch. If, if Raptor's recap to get people up to date was not enough, watch this video and you'll have a better picture of what Mike Watson's legacy has to hold. My name is Mike Watson. I'm the owner of Super Arcade. For the past few years, I've been dedicating myself in keeping the doors open here to provide a home for everyone that loves and enjoys to play video games. Arcades have been a part of my entire life, and I've seen the arcade culture affect many people in a very positive manner. I really like Third Strike because, who am I kidding, Third Strike sucks, this game's so ass. For you Mr. Wizard, thanks for throwing evil and uh, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You got some idiot named DSP who's shit, a total piece of shit, a total piece of shit by the way. I like to, I like to get that on YouTube. 
20,000 idiots are subscribed to him. That's great. Congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Watson has teeth. Mr. Watson has the power. With the use of truss, LED lighting, and a whole new layout, this place will become the eye candy that we all long for. Through my great experiences, I would like to pass it on to everyone else, and it would be such a pity to see a place like this go. And joining us now is Michael Watson. Mike, how you doing, man? Thank you for joining us. Hey, what's up, man? Uh, absolutely, man. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming on the show. First no question off the back. We're not going to beat around the bush. Why didn't Super Arcade open when you said it would last week? Okay, so I actually thought I would be open by the end of September. Uh, I posted that I would like to be open by October 14th, which would be one week before Wednesday Night Fights came to Santa Ana. Uh, due to more circumstances beyond my control, due to uh, California codes and uh, ADA compliancy, we have been set back even more. They're requesting us, uh, they were requesting us to build four restrooms at the new location. They wanted us uh, to build a bigger handicap ramp. They want us to change all three doors and make them panic doors so that if there was a fire and whatnot, we would be prepared. But, so, but, but Mike, surely you would knew that before you set the date. I mean, I would imagine you cross the T's and dot the I's before saying we're opening on this day. Okay, so here's the issue. We've been battling the city since back in April. And they suggested this location, which we leased out back in the beginning of a in the beginning of September. So I've been at this location for almost two months now. Um, they want us here. They've, they've said they wanted us here many, many times. They've insisted they're working with us and doing things very quickly. And they're just pulling up one thing after another, after another. And it, it just seems like a never ending saga at this point, as if we're just getting our leg pulled here and there, but we're just fighting through it and following all their rules and just making sure we do everything by the book. So there's no issues down the road. Now, was this a compromise? Was this the last place they would let you go? How do you feel about the new spot and, and what's been going on so far with getting it open? Well, honestly, uh, at first I didn't like it. I didn't like the fact that we were forced to not go to the previous location due to the city's, uh, I guess you would say, beef with that landlord. The entire city has some type of hatred for him. I don't know what he's done in the past or I don't know exactly the history of that shopping center in particular. But they're not allowing any new tenants in there. There's no businesses opening in that particular area. They're just getting rejected left and right. So I wasn't the only one. And uh, the funny thing is, when I first went to the city and applied for a permit at that location, the guy gave me a funny look. And I, I didn't think nothing of it at the time. But when you go back and you put the pieces together, it's kind of like watching, you know, one of those mystery movies. And you're like, ah, so this is what he was talking about. And he kind of offered me a refund back then. And he's like, are you sure you want to be here? And it was just, it's just one of those things where we just didn't see the, Mike, the warning do, do, do you feel the we pressure? We got kind of caught up in their little war. Mike, do you feel pressure like, shit, I just got to open up Super Arcade wherever the hell I can because I'm losing my audience or my crowd or my, my clientele base? I mean, what? Well, here's the thing. Like, why, was, why not stop, get it right, and then do it? I was really uh, pressured to get it open before, before Mortal Kombat came out, actually, because um, I thought that would be the, the new the new thing, and we would lose a lot of business if we didn't open by then. And then as the time went by, you know, I was just fighting and fighting to get it open, and we were trying to uh, open before Evo, because obviously the week before Evo, we have a lot of out-of-towners. People last year came from, like, Paris, Iraq, like, all over the world. They came to visit Singapore, Shin came, like, all these guys, they came over to play a Super Arcade before they head out to Vegas, and we didn't want to miss out on that business. But as the days went by, you just realized, hey, you know, this isn't going to happen. They're dragging it out. We were forced to go to two public hearings and just they, they weren't they weren't moving. So we had, to, we had to make a change. They suggested a new location. So we compromised and we just went with it. Now you've offered Wednesday Night Fights, obviously, as an alternative for this week. Do you think at this point it, it's time to kind of stop setting dates and to see where things go? Well, like I said, I mean, I was aiming and after all the work was done, we're – we only have about one week's physical labor left to do in this spot, and we already worked for like three weeks. So as soon as the permits are here, we're seven days from opening. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the real situation. And, uh, you know, the date I promised was actually two weeks after I expected to be open. So I wasn't – I was giving myself some leeway. But at this point, I don't know. Like these guys are just taking their time. They want to they wanna tell us to do something. Then they want to come look at it. And then after we do it, they want – you know, they just want to look at everything step by step by step. 
and just baby us through it to make sure everything's right for some reason. So Mike, we just have to Mike, deal with it. Just give him one of these right here, pal. Just do a little bit of this on the side and uh, take care of it right away. You know, if they were Asians over there, we would talk to them. <laughs> oh, and I'll tell you that for sure. But uh, that wasn't happening. Mike, I want to get back. Uh, I'm going to save the topic of these public hearings that you went through and how that went, because I think that it'll be the flip side of this story because there's a ton of support there. And you're having a lot of ton of support in this chat as well, although it's mixed. But what I do want to bring up before we get there is the very hot topic of the Kickstarter. You asked for money, money was given, you passed your goal. Um, since then, you say you now you need another 20K, if I'm not mistaken, for the bathroom renovations, things like that. People get very touchy when it comes to money. Hey, we gave you money and you're not delivering. What right. do you say well, to those people? Well, first off, I'm not asking for any more money from anyone. Um, I just stated the number, just letting people know the fight that we're in is for... The, the, the challenge is to save 20000 at this point. So it's worth the, the couple weeks that it's being delayed to save that 20000 uh, Another thing is with the Kickstarter, I've actually explained in my blog, I've even gone on websites and, you know, separated the amount of money that was spent on what and what and what. And obviously the old location was renovated. So it's not like I didn't keep any prom or break any promises for that matter. Um, we're just now trying to reopen our arcade. And this arcade is honestly costing at least $50,000 at this point. When I already spent, you know, so much money at the old location, this is this is money that comes out of my pocket. And the only reason I'm following through with this, I mean, I could have walked away from this a long time ago, just took my losses and went home. But the Kickstarter succeeded. So I have I have a responsibility to provide for the people that supported us. And that's why I'm still doing this. So that's that's what's driving me to complete this. Now, a lot of people who have been talking about this have obviously been online, but in person, you had support at the court hearings. Uh, well, how do you feel the local support is for what's going on right now with the delayed opening and the arcade in general? Um, the first hearing, no one really knew. Like I really thought and what I was told by the people of the city that it was just a matter of uh, just walking in there, telling them what's going on, and everything should be fine. But that didn't turn out to be the case, obviously, when when we were rejected and there were like five or six old people that were complaining about arcade lifestyle and people peeing on the floors was their excuse for not letting us in their city. So the second time around, it was very touching that uh, about a hundred people filled up the auditorium. And that's just, that's such a great feeling to know that all these people actually, you know, they care and they want us to succeed. And like I said, with their support, that just motivates me more and more to keep, keep on doing this until it's done. Uh, I meant to ask you a second ago, if the Kickstarter had failed, what then? What would you have done? Uh, probably kept running until the end of the year, just lose a little bit of money and just, like I said, just let it ride out to the end of the year and just walk away. Um, maybe think about, you know, running some tournaments somewhere or something or doing something under someone else's, you know, property. But yeah, there, there was no real plan. I mean, just go back to doing what I do and just walk away from this unwillingly. Mike, um, Mike over here uh, earlier mentioned this idea that there's a split between people who are supporting you there on the ground that are invested in your success and then the epic troll fest that exists on our capo where they've made you one of their main targets and they eat that shit up now i want to talk about that but i want to preface it by saying you are feeding the trolls in many instances by even posting on there and putting yourself open to that your thoughts on that and why the hell you would put yourself through it. Okay, so we talk about stream monsters being part of the FTC, and I've said it many times. So if the stream monsters are part of the FTC, then, you know, anybody that talks about Street Fighter, anybody that talks about it, they're all part of the FTC, being as if they're good, they're bad, it doesn't matter. But opinions are people's opinions, and I, I believe I'm one of the only people that posts under a name that everyone knows who it is, whereas these guys, they just hide behind, you know, a keyboard or what and you know if that's what they want to do that's what they want to do but I, I just tell people like it is i try to seriously go through and answer all the questions and uh eventually it just it just becomes so silly and it gets ridiculous but that that site has provided a few good things they send a lot of players to events and stuff and uh they they're they're our audience i mean we need people to watch our our streams and whatnot and they make up a, a good portion of that so we just deal with it i mean I'm a player too, you know, and I'm, I'm a stream monster too. I'm just one of these guys, but I just happen to be in a position where I also am an arcade owner or I was an arcade owner at the time. And it's just, it is what it is. You know, like I'll talk to people. I don't need to, I don't need to, 
pretend who I'm not and I don't need to sell out to worry about appeasing sponsors or not. Like that's not, that's not what I do. I'm here to provide a place for people to play. I'm here to play myself. I'm here to, I'm here to talk to everyone. I'm here to answer anything. And I've never gone in hiding. I've never done anything. People ask me questions. I've always, always answered every question. So if they think they're succeeding, if they think they're winning some type of like, award or if they want a cookie for asking me stupid questions that I answer if that floats their boat then so be it you know I mean it doesn't bother me and I'll continue to answer everyone's questions regardless of how dumb they are or, you know if they're trolling me they're trolling me Mike, whatever you know I've been asking matter. you a ton of questions am I gonna get a cookie after this sure <laughs> all right cool uh, these, these are some of the things that that you told me they say about you on our cap and we're gonna list them and then again I'm gonna ask you why the hell you put yourself through it Watson is a poor businessman Watson is greedy Valle left because of that Watson can't feed his wife and kid. Watson is fat and ugly. You, that's what you sent me to kind of uh, paraphrase the kind of shit you get on R Kappa. Again, why do you validate that? Super Arcade doesn't need R Kappa to exist, does it? Uh, dude, I, like I said, like, R Kappa is part of the FPC. It, it is what it is. Like, I choose to play in the mud with these guys, and we can, we can go toe-to-toe if they want. It doesn't bother me. You know, I'm here. They know what I look like. They know who I am. They call me fat. They call me ugly. But I mean, when they look in the mirror, what are they? You know, are you some model with the six pack? Are you like some Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt looking ass motherfucker? With, you know, with the physique of like Van Damme in his prime? Like, probably not. So you say what you want. Whatever helps you uh, make your day go by better. If you want to clown me and that helps you get through your day, that's cool with me because it doesn't bother me, man. I'm just gonna keep doing what I do. And how, do, how, go ahead, how do you feel about the fact that you're you're representing Super Arcade at that point? Is this is this a personal vendetta that you're having with the chat? Is this you representing Super Arcade to them? What does Super Arcade do for the community as a whole, and how does the way you represent yourself on Kappa affect that? Well, I look at Super Arcade like this. Super Arcade's like the gym in your hometown. It might not be, you know, like global gym with all your like super sophisticated workout equipment and like all these lights and shine everywhere. But if you come here, you're going to get better at fighting games. That's the bottom line. If you're serious about getting better at fighting games, people have seen it. They, If you just watch the streams, you notice, like, the guys that sucked in the beginning are getting top eight in Street Fighter. The guys that are, like, the shitty players, now they go to EVO and they place, you know, top 32, which is a huge accomplishment in, like, a 2,000-man tournament. You come to our spot, you're going to get better at fighting games. If you just, If your goal is to just get on stream and do some kind of dumb dance or you want to be in some, like, some exotic like environment with a bunch of lights flashing everywhere and you want to pay some crazy venue fees to go like $50 to go to a tournament, then hey, that's your prerogative. If you want to get better at Street Fighter, if you want some real competition, that's what Super Arcade provides. So, Mike, that's I, all we care I, I, about. I'm glad you brought that up, Mike, because we had Alex Valle on last week and he said he's building the future, which to me implies that you can have what's left. How do you feel about that? The past. Well, like I said, we, we separated not because of one incident he's going his way we're going our way and uh, i don't want to call him a sellout but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna sit here and pretend to be all professional and i'm not gonna like tie your shoes for you or shine your shoes and ask you for a, a sponsorship check or anything like that that's not me we provide a place if people like it they will come here and they will play that's that's the bottom line i think we've proven time and time again people like to come here people we even open up Friday nights for casuals, which we charge $5 for people to play all night long from like, you know, till three in the morning, you can play Street Fighter with top competition all night for $5. So we're, we're dedicated to making the player better. We don't care about the glamour. We don't care about the glitz. Is getting paid good? Sure. Getting paid sweet. But like I said, if we have to sell out to do stuff like that. And if we got to shine someone's shoes to get a couple bucks, then it's totally not worth it. Now, what's interesting is that Valle said, basically exactly the same thing they'll go where they want to go and we want to make the players better you've taken this to the point where you just you know you're having people at your arcade the same night his whatever how do you feel about the direction the fgc has gone which is definitely not parallel to that so i wouldn't say it's not parallel to that i want to say like there there still are people that want to get better like the people he's talking about potential people coming to the place i'm talking about keeping the current fan base and making that fan base better. If he wants to if he wants to make, you know, a new generation of players better, then that's on him. If he if he needs to have like a bunch of lollipops and candy to attract these kids to come and play, so be it. You want to come to my gym, it's like Apollo Creed teaching Balboa how to fight again after Mickey died, you know? Like we're just gonna go hard. <laughs> we're gonna go hard. If you suck, we're gonna tell you, look man, you suck, dude, and this is how you get better. 
And if you can deal with it, you're going to be a better player for it. If you can't deal with it and you're just going to be all prissy and soft, then Super Arcade's probably not for you. So, I mean, we just do what we do. We just train people. We try to get people better. You come to our environment and you will get better. That's, that's it. Mike, uh, you, you, you strike me as the kind of guy, clearly, I think anybody will, will see this as a guy that uh, acts potentially impulsively, is real, so to speak, uh, acts on emotion, uh, sometimes rash decisions. Uh, we played at the top of the interview uh, clips from your previous exploits, one telling uh, the DSP is a piece of shit, Dark Side <laughs> Phil, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Uh, for effect, I repeated it three times in the video. I, th I thought you'd appreciate that. Uh, as well as saying, hey, Mr. Wizard, thanks for running Evo. Fuck you. Uh, so I get it. You know, like that's part of it, right? Like that, 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 that's who you are and you're not pretending to be anybody else. The question is, how's that working out for you? Okay, so Super Arcade, obviously, I mean, we, we weren't making a lot of money. We were just getting by. But the problem is I was used to making a lot of money because of my previous professions and I actually went back to the, the profession that I was good at. I played poker and I do mortgages and stuff like that. And there's a whole lot more money in that than, you know, catering to people to give you $5 per person or machines that take quarters. That's, that's a pretty, pretty tough thing, but I do it for the love of street fighter. Like, as you can see, even though I'm not competing anymore at a high level, I'm not, you know, working at my, working on my game to stay, you know, on top. Like, when people talk about, like, old incidents and stuff, it, it riles me up. Like, the DSP incident, that shit really pissed me off. When you train all year long, and then go play some garbage version of a game, and then you got some guy thinking he's hot shit that you've been kicking his ass for his whole life, and then all of a sudden, oh, look, we got Neo Geo version of Street Fighter, now I'm good all of a sudden. Like, shit like that irks me, you know, because I put, I put in a lot of my time into Street Fighter. I put in a lot into competing, and, you know, I got to the top of the mountain, and I've tasted victory. That's why, that's what people yearn for. You just want... You just want to be able to say you were the best at least once in your life. And just just these people, they're just they don't they don't understand that that passion, that drive. Like if you talk to top players, they practice three, four, even like five hours a day just to stay on top of their game. It requires a lot of motivation, a lot of dedication. But uh yeah, it just seems like nowadays these kids they're just playing for fun and if they get top eight, they're like, Okay, it doesn't matter if I lose tomorrow, like I'm top eight on stage and they don't care about winning. So My it is just it's just a difference in, sure. in the generations. Uh, but staying on this tip of, uh, of you uh, courting controversy, you told me yourself, hey, I don't know how brave you are, but if you want to bring it up, I'll talk about it. And you were referring to uh, this quote-unquote beef that you have with Mr. Wizard. And I want to preface from reading your blog posts on the topic, I'm going to do the TLDR version uh, of what you posted on there. And uh, this is it. This is what you wrote on the blog post to the recap. Get bitched for not telling Wizard where I was on the road. Get yelled at after conforming and yelling only stops when someone steps in to stop him. Get lied to over and over about winning the Canon Award. You were expecting the Canon Award. You were led on. You didn't get it. And uh, you were upset about that. And then you put it on the internet. You said, bring it up. I suspect there was something you wanted to say about it, and that's why you suggested it to me. So, what would you like to say on that topic, Mike? Well, you know, Wizard, uh, he's a very unique individual, to say the least. Um, I really wish Evo didn't have him as the face of Evo and as their head of PR, because the canons and the community, I, I really think they deserve better than that. Wizard's a power-hungry guy. He abuses his power all the time, and you know, this guy likes to put me down. He likes to talk a lot of shit, and he thinks he's just, like, the, the Jesus of the community when, in fact, he's no better than any of us, you know? Like, when Valle and me and Wizard, all of us were at Golfland, like, he's doing the same shit we were doing. Like, just like I go to R Kappa, he was also swimming with us when we were, you know, when we were little kids. Like, we're all, a, we're all from the same, cut from the same cloth, in a sense, like, from the video game community, so... For him now to act like he's all high and mighty, it just, it just irks me. And like I said, I mean, they could use anyone to be the face of Evo. Like, throw Mike Ross out there. Do whatever, you know? Like, anybody. Anybody but Wizard. That's just, that's what pisses me off. He's very, very greedy. He's very selfish. And he's, oh, here's another, here's another thing that pisses me off. So I just found out recently, this piece of shit accused me of DDoSing the cannons. And 
I don't even know how the fuck to do that, to be honest. So for him to accuse me of that and try to, like, mess up our relationship between me and the Cannons, I've known them for, you know, almost 20 years. Why would he try to do that? It's just he's a very, very unique individual, and I think he has some type of social disorder or some kind of sickness, to be honest. So, Mike, tell us how you really feel about Mr. Wizard, would you? <laughs> oh, I love that guy, man. He's fucking great. Uh, Mike, uh, we're going to have to reach out to Mr. Wizard and ask him to respond. Definitely. That doesn't mean he will. doesn't mean he has to. Uh, but this basically concludes the interview portion of the show. We're going to move on to round three where we usually... I'd like to, well, I'd like to ask oh, one all question means. first, which is, you know, you, you were definitely a big name in Street Fighter 2, and even in Street Fighter 3, you said in the video you got top eight despite not caring, but you were quite an impressive player. How do you feel about Street Fighter 4? How do you feel about the upcoming Street Fighter 5? And why do you feel that fighting games aren't as good as they used to be? Okay, so to generalize on the last question, why they're not as good as they used to be, I think they made it to uh, the comeback mechanics and stuff to make it feel like everybody can be good at the game. I mean, I understand why they do it to make the game marketable and to have people not want to quit after day one and getting their ass kicked by someone more skillful than them. But just having like easy inputs for uppercuts and stuff like that, I think that kind of ruins the game and takes a lot of skill out. Also, these option selects, they're just crazy. Like you put in you put in like so many options and the computer chooses the best option for you. That's not that's no longer playing a, a skillful game. It's just you might as well have like trained monkeys or robots playing the game at that point because human decision making is is not being focused on now, this. Street Fighter 2 had that plenty point. of option selects. I mean, T-Hawk can end a round by, by jabbing you and command grabbing you and following it up. I mean... Yeah, but definitely... that didn't exist until recent. That was oh, not okay. in the game when the game was competitive. So that's another thing. No, no, what were your first two questions? I'm sorry, about Street Fighter 4 you're asking? It was just, do you, th- do you think Street Fighter 5 can make up for that or is it is there no hope left? Uh, from talking to Combo Fiend, he's told me that it's going to have that old school feel to it. But from my short experiences with the game i think the damage is really high right now um characters like cammy when she activated her v trigger she's super fast super strong and i saw like your whole life bar disappears in like three seconds something needs to be kind of toned down with that but as far as like the regular moves and you know the, the anti-spamming and stuff like that, i think this, the game will be back to its more skillful state than it was in street fighter 4 where it was a vortex and the option select just trap game all day what, what, why is it a thing that Whatever game you're playing, that game sucks. In that video, that old ass uh, interview that you have for Evo, uh, what do I like about? I really like Third Strike. No, actually, I. Why am I lying? I fucking this game sucks. Why is that a thing? You're winning. You're at the top. Is it just a cool thing to say? Oh well, this game's no, shit. No, actually, I don't even like Third it. Strike. It was brought about that uh, Family Fun. They used to think all the players at an arcade and Family Fun. They used to think they were they were the big shit in America, and no one else was better than them in that game. And then that motivated me to get good at that game to beat those guys. And I just came back to play just because I just go where the competition is at. If the game that I like is dead, then it's dead. You can't do anything about it. So you just got to play what other people play. And that's, what, that's the game that was played at the time. Do you plan on trying to compete in the future? I think I got a lot on my plate at the time. Um, I just dyed my hair so you can't see all the gray, but I'm pretty old now. So <laughs> yeah, probably, probably not. It's the, the towel's been thrown in a while back. I'll just play for fun here and there and ruin some dreams, but nothing... Uh, Nothing serious in the future. Well, speaking of competing, uh, I'm glad you brought up the question about fighting games a second ago, but the reason why I wanted to keep you around a little bit longer in round three is because we're going to watch a third strike match that you sent me versus Mester. So we're going to go into round three now. Now, before we start it, I mean, a lot of the new Street Fighter 4 players may not know who Mester is. Can you give us a little background on Mester the player, this Third Strike tournament, and just you playing Third Strike in general? So when me, Vai, Choi, and a couple other guys went to uh, Japan way before even, uh, like, SBO existed, the, the tournament before SBO, we had a five-on-five five in, like, every game. And Mester at that time was the number one Third Strike player in the world. And he, dude, he just he whooped our ass left and right. And I waited, like, I wasn't that good at the game at that time. And I obviously, you know, leveled up a lot after coming back from Japan, playing that game and being motivated to play. And I waited a long time to play this guy again. This guy, he actually wrote FAQs for this book. And they were, it wasn't even double spaced, like, uh, typing on the sheet. And it was as thick as a phone book. So this guy, he was just crazy. He was, an encycl- <laughs> he was a 3S encyclopedia. And to this day, this guy's still a monster. I think he's probably still, like, maybe top five in the world at that game, but he was definitely number one at the time, and that was scary. 
Yeah, and you were saying that he was like the young uh, pioneer. Yeah, one definitely the young, one of the young pioneers at Third Strike. Okay, we're going to get into a match. This is you at the same tournament where the Evo Moment 37 happened, I believe is what you told me. Is that correct? Yes. All right, here we go. It's going to play in a second, I promise. <laughs> as soon as this little hard drive boots up. Now, but in this ga- in this match, you you parry quite a bit. You have good de- defense, but you play pretty basic. You sweep after parries, oftentimes. You do various. What was your relationship with Third Strike? Did you play it just to beat other people? Did you, you said you didn't like the game very much? What was wrong with the game to you? Um, parrying seemed to be parrying is the the randomizer in the game. Like when you're going to kill someone, and one parry can lead into like a hundred percent combo with characters like Yurian and Makoto then it it just takes i feel like it takes a lot out of the, out of the game like it limits the skill whereas if one person gets lucky one time your entire game's over and that just i, I just dislike that about the game a lot and were you confident going into this match was it a surprise you won did you train hard specifically for this how how did okay, you so feel okay be- so before this match mester played daigo and i knew for a fact if i played daigo i'd beat him cuz i <laughs> like i don't lose the ken ken match like that's just not something i do and Ken was his main character. So when Daigo beat Mester, I was just like, fuck, I'm not going to make top eight. This sucks. My tournament's going to be over. But then I just thought about, man, I've been waiting a long time to play this bastard. He made us look stupid back in the day. I'm going to try my best and we'll see what happens. So, yeah, I just took, took the game real slow, didn't let anything overwhelm me, and uh, just went at it from there. Mike, uh, Justin Wong in the chat says that you suck at third strike. Uh, if Justin wants to look up, every time... So here's the thing. Every Evo, fucking Justin beat me, right? Every single damn Evo. And it went to third game, third round, and he beat me by like two pussy hairs every fucking time. <laughs> that shit pissed me off, dude. Yours Justin, or his? Shit. I'm going to fucking get you one day, bro. I'm going to wait till you're old, and I'm going to let you see how it is to be old and play these games. But there was also a match where uh, we played West Coast, East Coast, and I took out Justin on Team East Coast, so he can hold that one too. That was an Evo, and that's on camera. Chun Chun, Justin, better than you, bro. All right, Mike, we're going to let you go here. But first, I want to ask you a question since we talked about it on the top of the show. Who's right, KBR or FChamp? Oh, that's a tough one. Like, as a competitor at heart, I played anyone in my day. But, I mean, they're, they're in a sense, they're, they're both right, I guess. It's tough. Like, it's really tough. In the generation nowadays, KBR is right. Back in my day, Filipino champ's right. So, I mean, it's, it's 2015, so you got to... You got to let it slide once in a while during these days. That's interesting that, I mean, because it's some of the things that, that, that are recurring that I find cool are like, you know, Snake Eyes goes to Japan to train recently. You're talking about how back in the day you went to Japan to train. So there are some things that stay constant and there are like, you know, things that are, uh, you know, revered in the FGC as you went to Japan. Oh, shit, he probably leveled up a lot. But you just admitted that the times are changing. I mean, Alex Vai is at an esports venue. Where are we headed, Mike? Where are we headed? You're holding on tight, and you have a lot of loyalists and a lot of good talent that go to your tournaments, but where are we headed, compadre? Hopefully, the bigger the scene gets, the better it is for everybody. So we just got to just gotta keep making establishments and making tournaments viable for larger crowds. And, you know, like I said, it, everything is going in the right direction. It's just we can't be blinded by the, the money that's being, you know, inserted now into the industry. It's just I think these companies are just throwing money out there trying to get what they can out of the community. And when they realize they're not going to get too much, the money is going to be gone. So we're just going to be left with our grassroots once again. So I think it's a dangerous time. I hope people don't get used to the money because, like I said, these big names, they like to show up to tournaments with, like, pot guarantees and stuff like that. And it seemed like it's not about the competition anymore. It's more about the money. But we got to keep it so that it, it is about the competition. It's for the love of the game. It's for the competition. So don't be blinded by the money. That's all I can, that's all I can really suggest to these players. Mike? Thank you very much for coming on the show and talking to us. We threw some tough questions at you. You, as promised, you answered them all. Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, maybe you'll come back on another time once maybe Super well, Arcade opens thanks up. Thanks for the invite, guys. Great show you guys do there, man. All right, Mike. Thank you so much, man. We'll see you next time. All right. Other Mike. Original Mike. Well, I guess he's older. I definitely would not be the original Mike. <laughs> Your thoughts on uh, Mike Watson's presentation here. Again, uh, we get some controversial figures on the show. I think people take him the wrong way. I mean, he came out of here and said he's a controversial dude. And I mean, you don't have to like the way he acts, but he's not opening super arcade on a later date to piss people off. And maybe, you know, maybe he should have been a little more planned than what he did, but he's still opening an arcade for the community. And I really don't think he has any ulterior motives. As he said, there's, there's much more money to be had elsewhere and he's got 
really solid roots in the scene. Please support arcades. Like, Why not? Please. Exactly. Like, I live in one of the only cities in Austin, Texas. We have Arcade UFO. There's Super Arcade in California, and you're really kind of you're getting to the end of that list. And I, I think the guy is doing it for the good reason. And whether you like him or not, don't ruin the community for everyone. Is my exactly. opinion. Uh, we obviously have some matches to get into here, which, uh, as we promised in round three, we talk about uh, replays. No one cares about anime, sorry, but I do. Uh, but I'll tell you what people do care about. They've been asking, is that a Chilean shirt or a Texas shirt? Definitely Texas. Did Texas have anything to do uh, with CEO Taku and top eights of any of these games? Texas did well. Uh, we had Darren Faulty Defense from Houston got third in Guilty Gear X third, and then Oso got top eight as well. Okay, let's get into a match. This is from Grand Finals, Katsunoko versus Dagra. Yeah, so Japanese definitely dominated this tournament as a whole. Goichi, a very famous doujin game, which is like typically the less popular anime games uh, made by companies like French Bread, won all of those games. And uh, Dog Girl won Blaze Blue, and Dog Girl won Guilty Gear, and Yoshiki won Blaze Blue. And it was Japanese dominated as a whole, unsurprisingly. It's good that we had them out there, though. Uh, Dog Girl won Guilty Gear here with Sin, and you see him doing these jump loops. Sin is a character that needs to eat to refresh the bar in the bottom. If he has food meter, he's allowed to cancel his special moves into other special moves, kind of similar to a King of Fighters HD cancel. And to do this, he needs to eat to get the meter up at the end of combos, which has a lot of lag. And you see Time him... Time out. Eating? Is he like, you know, like he Birdie and Street Fighter Five? He literally a giant, you know, piece of chicken or fish or something like that, gains some of this meter, and you see him doing combos that are much more difficult specifically to conserve this food meter. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. Let's go into the next round. Who, do you th- who, who looked like they should have won this? Obviously, somebody won, but was it looking like it Dog could go Dog Girl way? played very cleanly and, and pretty much dominated the majority of the tournament. Uh, here what you see is he's using the three punch. That's his down forward staff pull move. And what that does is allows him to bait Soul's DP as a meaty. So it makes it much safer for him to go for offense. And then at the end of the match, you see him doing a jumping heavy instant overhead. Now, normally this can't combo into anything, but with his extremely quick super, it's just enough to close out the match. Uh, we're going to go into the last clip, but before we do, you were telling me something about Japanese players. All these gods of fighting games, none of them started in Street Fighter. Mo- well, I wouldn't say none of them started in Street Fighter, but I think what a lot of people don't realize is that, yeah, Street Fighter 4 is the big game right now. Street Fighter 5 will definitely be the biggest game when it comes out, and Street Fighter is the granddaddy of them all, but a lot of the big players you know and love have roots in other games and learned a lot from playing other games. Daigo played Guilty Gear. Kazunoko plays and played Guilty Gear. Nemo came from Guilty Gear. Um, and then you have a variety of other players who have played other games. I mean, Xian was a King of Fighters SBO champion. And then both of the Chinese big players that are big right now, Dako and Shaohai, come from King of Fighters as well. So I, there's something to be said, and I don't know if this is getting preachy or not, for learning these various fighting games, the fundamentals that come with them, and supporting games that aren't just the big two. Or Go. big one at this point. Who cares about Marvel? <laughs> yeah right you said it yourself marvel's dead anyway this is the the last clip and here uh you see one of the more unique things we're starting with the end of course when we, we loops um of guilty gear x third as opposed to the old games which is a roman cancel is a rapid cancel and various other games basically in this game kind of like x factor you can cancel your moves when they hit or get blocked or in various situations new to guilty gear x third is you can cancel a move in the startup using 50 of your meter, and you'll flash yellow. You'll see this various points in the match. This slows down the game, and it lets you play various mind games and check what's going on so that you can have a better pace of the match. If you see them air dashing during the freeze, you can anti-air them. If you see them backing away, you can go in, etc. And what you see here is Dogger make great use of that to keep the flow of the match in his favor and double-check himself before he runs into something that, that will hurt him. Mike? PhD in anime. Thank you very much for that breakdown. Unfortunately, I, I wasn't at Evo. Apparently, my team got third. <laughs> hey, those who can't do, teach. Yes, that's, I guess <laughs> that's the point. But I will say, and I've said this before on the show, that the anime scene in America has been getting stronger. SKD from New York won the Blaze Blue Singles event at Evo over various Japanese players. And I think there's definitely something here, even if it's small. And so thank you, Jabaley, for running a tournament for us, us little folks in the FGC. Yes, thank you, Jabaley, and thank you guys for watching The Best of Three, presented by The Daily Dot. We work hard to put on a good show for you guys, bring you the good guests, so it really helps us if you like the channel, follow the channel, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Really, it'll show us that you guys want us to keep doing it. So again, 
Thank you very much for watching the best of three presented by The Daily Dot.